I'm going to go ahead and start. We'll let the stragglers straggle if they want to. Anyway, so welcome back. <laughs> and thank you for coming back this week. Okay, you ready to go? Ready to learn? Yep. Last week we established what? That all of us are writers, one kind or another, right? Everybody's a writer, and we probably have been for most of our lives. We talked about some of my history and some of my experiences, and, uh, and there were a few tips along the way that I hope you remembered because they were on the sheet that we passed out last week along with the exercises. One of the things I talked about was uh, establishing a private, quiet workplace to, uh, to do your writing, and um, as well as to give you some encouragement and some ideas on how to get started or restarted, as the case may be. So I want to know, did any of you make any rearrangements at home? Or do you feel like you already have a good, good place to, uh, to do the work you want to do? Well, we're good. We also handed out some ha homework assignments. Those are due on Friday. Uh, and uh, I do hope you'll try them out. I, I, I have heard from a couple of you that you're working on them, and that's great. Um, how about a show of hands? Any, who, is, who is working on them? Not, okay, most people. And even, even Don is working on them, but he didn't hear my question. <laughs> so that's, it looks like everybody then. Well, that's good. Okay, well, today what I want to do is get into what I call more nuts and bolts and, um, and, and uh, some other concepts that should be helpful to you. Does everybody have a handout? Okay. And by the way, there's, if anybody does need an extra copy of the exercises, they're over there on the, uh, on the table. And uh, those of you watching by 1390 or by video, again, all you have to do is uh, email me or give me a call. And I'll either put them in your box or uh, as well as today's handout. And, uh, or I'll email them to you, whichever is, is best for you. So um, let's get into some nuts and bolts here. Oh, and also if you want to take pictures of the screen, go feel free to do that. Most of the stuff I'm going to go through is on the handout, uh, but n not all of it. And um, I won't be following the handout exactly necessarily in the exact order that it's there. So um, you, can, uh, you can take notes if you want or move things around. Now, first, let's have a look at the infinite variety of things you can write. We obviously aren't all going to be writing all of these things, but, but this is just a, a kind of a sampling of what I said was the infinite variety of stuff. Novels or novellas, a novella, of course, is a short very short novel, short story, flash fiction, which is a, like a short story only, it's maybe only 50 words, maybe up to 100, under, up to 1,500 words. Uh, satire, parody, poem, article or essay, write a song. Um, sometimes poems are, and songs are the same thing, or they can be. In my case, I've written several poems that turned into songs. Um, a memoir. Autobiography, I know that there are a couple of people in, in, in this group and also from the last fall's group that are working on autobiographies. You could be writing a sermon, a Sunday school lesson, or you could be writing, doing technical writing, a textbook, or a curricula for a, for a course. A letter to the editor, you have to be careful how you write those as well. Uh, or, uh, and, 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 you know, the editor could be the newspaper magazine, your alumni magazine, whatever it is, that's writing. Or you could be writing a play. Anybody have any other things to add to that list and anything I might have left off in, in my attempt to cover the infinite variety? <coughs> okay. Now, obviously, this is not going to be a class on how to write a novel or how to write a short story because each one of those would require really a separate, a separate class. But if you are interested in pursuing any one of those things in more depth, there are colleges and universities around here that have courses in that. Um, some of them have uh, uh, degrees that you can get in it. The Master of Fine Arts degree, or MFA, is one that you may have heard of if you want to go really all the way. Okay, last week we talked about how to get ready to write. Finding the quiet place, the good time to do it, no distractions, and so on. And if you're comfortable doing that, if you got your place and you kind of know how to get settled down, 
there's a, uh, another exercise you can do at home that gets the creative juices flowing, and that's called morning pages. This is from a book called The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron, which I thought was a pretty good book, and it's, it'll be on, it's on the list of resources, I think, there. What morning pages are, it's, 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 I'm just gonna read this, three pages of longhand, doesn't necessarily have to be cursive, stream of consciousness writing done first thing in the morning, and there's no wrong way to do morning pages. They're not high art, they're not even writing according to her. They're about anything and everything that crosses your mind and they're for your eyes only. Morning pages provoke, clarify, comfort, cajole, prioritize, and synchronize the day at hand. Don't overthink it, just put three pages of anything on the page and then do three more pages tomorrow. Does that sound like too much? No. Yes? <laughs> well. What you, what you do if you want to get into this, and I, I, I would really recommend it, is write for 10, or 10 to 30 minutes each day. Uh, 10 minutes is not a bad place to start. Um, you just, in, in some circles, this is called journaling. Have you ever heard of journaling? It's more, but usually that's more in a religious context, um, but it's, it's really quite similar. Has anybody ever done any of that sort of thing, journaling? Okay, well, if you do that, just sit down and you start writing. I think last week we talked about just, you know, if, even if just a word pops into your head, just write that word down and just kind of go from there and go with whatever the flow is that comes to you. And you'll be surprised what you'll find when you start doing that. Um, I haven't done it that way in a while, but when I was doing it, I got a couple of really good things out of it. Uh, this, the, one, of the, one of the gems I mined, if you will, for, from, from journaling or morning pages was that story, the uh, meeting at the center of the universe, which I told you about, which was the short story that really was the breakthrough story that got me connected with the publisher. And, and you know, three of those four books followed from that. So you never know what you're gonna find. Uh, another one was a, a uh, first draft of a short story about when the apostle Peter came to, uh, to visit Cornelius' house in Acts 10, remember that? Um, and it was written from the view of the point, uh, from point of view of a servant in the house. And I called it downstairs at Cornelius's house. Of course, I had Downton Abbey and upstairs, downstairs in mind, but it, it worked pretty well. And, um, uh, and it was light but serious at the same time. Also, as I said before, if, you, if you're staring at a blank page or a blank screen and that's intimidating, just start dictating into your phone. Forget the paper, forget the screen. Just pull out your phone and start talking into it. Whatever comes to mind, you can always transcribe it later. Once again, don't get it right, get it written. Don't sweat the details. Uh, Don was just talking about that uh, before we got started, about how his experience with that. If you, if, you, if you start correcting yourself as you go along, you'll just stop. You just will not be able to go with the flow of whatever's in your mind and what you're trying to write. Uh, this is especially true, I find, of, of, with dialogue. Uh, dialogue requires, you know, quotation marks and commas and this and that, and when do I leave the quotation marks out? And, and it's, it's, it drives you nuts if you don't, if you, if you worry about it. If you're gonna write dialogue, and unless you have kind of a, a facility for writing it with all the right punctuation, don't even punctuate it, just write it and then, uh, then you can go back and fix it later. Um, in my case, I'm really blessed because sometimes the dialogue al almost writes itself and, uh, it, and I sometimes let it do that. Uh, I really sometimes don't know where my characters are going. I don't know what they're gonna say. And, but that's a lot of fun <laughs> because sometimes just sitting down and letting the characters take over has gotten me out of a situation that I've written myself into that if I step back and said, how do I get out of this? I might not have known. So just kind of let the, let the characters take the, uh, take the lead for you. Go with the flow. And uh, it'll work a lot better. And that leads into the idea of living in the world you create. If you're in that world, you'll find that you have kind of adopted some of the characteristics of the characters. Not all of them, of course but maybe one or two, and maybe the protagonist or whoever you're writing about at the time. So you have an idea 
what's going on in that character's mind, you've created that world with your imagination. And that is another reason that it tends to flow more naturally, the writing the dialogue and, and, and the what's going on. What you're doing, in a way, is like an actor assuming the, the, uh, the identity of the character that he's playing. Um, some you might call it like being in the zone. And then, uh, of course, once you've done that, you've immersed yourself in this, and then you stop writing for a while, you come out of that world, and you have to go back into it. So there is a process of entry and re-entry and back and forth, and there may be some culture shock involved, either way you go. But to me, that makes it just that much more fun. Now, the next point, the importance of names. I looked this up. Charles Dickens has 989 named characters in all of his work, and that's incredible. Uh, some of my favorites are Ebenezer Scrooge, Oliver Twist, Tiny Tim, Madame Defarge, Anthony Chuzzlewit, Jeremiah Flintwinch, and Mrs. Wimple. I, I found a list of them online. I don't know if it had all 989, but I couldn't get through the list without laughing at some of the names. But I was laughing mostly in awe and admiration because those names, funny as they may sound when you just read them off, they have character, they're, they're evocative, they help, an, they help explain and define the characters, or they set a mood or a tone without necessarily being explicit. And I think that's brilliant. Uh, Shakespeare has some brilliant names too, um, and some of them are hilarious. Dogberry, Bottom, Malvolio, Gravediggers, Mercutio, Sir John Falstaff, now a famous beer, and those are only the funny ones, so uh, it's, it's, it's really important to, uh, to take a look at, at the names that you're coming up with. Here's a bunch of names that you'll be very familiar with. And you can go through this list. Each one of these names brings up an idea or an image or a feeling. They're, they're very well done. James Bond. Now, I think that name, even if you'd never read a James Bond novel or seen the movie, would have some, some weight to it. You know, there's something about that name that has a, that has a, a have a gravitas, if you will. Uh, Dorothy Gale, you know who Dorothy Gale is? That's uh, the Wizard of Oz, yeah. Gale, she gets caught up in a tornado. So there's a pun there that the author has used. Um, Darth Vader sounds very dark and, and uh, forbidding. Uh, Vito Corleone, the, the quintessential uh, mafia boss, and so on and so on down the road. One of my favorites is Holly Golightly, which is how we would pronounce it. But in the movie, one of the characters who had to pronounce that name all the time was either Chinese or Japanese, I can't remember which, and he couldn't. Holly Golightly. And so that was a, a, a humorous device that the author used uh, to, uh, to build some, some, some uh, laughs into the, into the whole thing. Okay, Hawkeye Pierce from MASH. Dirk Pitt, the adventurer. Uh, Sam Spade, the hard-bitten detective. And his name's just, and Clark Kent, the nebbish. But we all know him as Superman. So I think name selection is one of the most fun parts of writing myself. And uh, I always try to choose, not always, but most of the time choose them to say something about the character's personality, his or her strengths and weaknesses and so forth. Um, and, and, uh, and it works pretty well. So, um, I, I could read some of mine here, but since you haven't read my stuff mostly, uh, probably they wouldn't mean much to you. But, um, and and uh, you'll see that I went to extremes a lot of times in, in coming up with some of these names. But and you don't have to go to extremes. But do have a care when you're naming your characters. Look up their meanings. You may not have ever thought to do that, but if you have come up with a name for a character, go to Google or whatever it is and look up, you know, name, of, name meaning for whatever the name is. And you'll get, you know, the baby name websites will come up and, and some others. And it'll tell you what the name means and what the origin of it is. And, uh, and it will help you decide whether that name is one that you really want to use. 
if in and of itself it doesn't, uh, doesn't carry a certain message. Um, you also need to Google and see how many people may actually have that name. Now, obviously, I'm not talking about just a first name or just a last name, but uh, two names combined, you know, John Smith. Clearly, millions of people are named John Smith, so you're pretty safe. But if you come up with uh, a name that's a little more unusual, you should Google it and find out how many other people have that name. Um, I had a wonderful name, I can't remember what it was, but for one of my female characters, when I looked it up, it turned out there's a transgender porn star in New York using that name, so I had to find another one. Uh, now, but it just shows you how important it is. And the names don't have to be funny or clever, they could be meaningless if that's what you want. And all I'm saying is when you name a character, give it some thought. Now let's talk about music and word choices and, and phrasing. Probably is, is true of any language, but I know it's true in English. There's an infinite number of ways, of ways to say things in, in our language, and, and you get to choose. It's part of the beauty of writing, it's part of the fun. You choose sometimes based on the way it sounds when you read it aloud, or even how it sounds in your head, because your reader's probably not reading it aloud. And this is called music. How does it sound? You get the, the term music is often used in connection with poetry, but it really is it's the same concept for, for narrative and prose as well. Um, for example, they ran away, okay, that's fine, or they fled, which one do you like better? You get to choose. I like, well, it depends on the circumstances, what the context of it is, and they, they both say the same thing. So how does it sound when it's read aloud? Is it easy to read? Does it sound good? Or if you want it to sound bad, does it? You know, you can write bad stuff on purpose too. Here's another example. The second story bedroom of his house on Oak Street. Well, I could have called it Cedar Street, but I think the house on Oak Street is easier to say, but you might want the alliteration of Cedar Street, which would be alliteration going along with the second story. So the second story bedroom of his house on Cedar Street. You just might like that kind of music better than the other one. Now, if you've already established that Oak Street is an important street in your story, you're probably not going to change it to Cedar Street just so this one sentence is going to sound that way. The point is to be thinking about these things. Uh, there's some other kinds of choices. My father is bald. You could do the euphemism. My father is follically challenged. <laughs> or you can, you, can, uh, you can play around with double talk. I was unavoidably detained from arriving probably would never say that. You'd say, I was late. And now, some of this is a matter of style. Uh, you know, what are the, what's the mood you're going for? But you really need to be aware of these kind of choices, and there's many more, and make conscious decisions about them. Don't just, again, just write out what you're going to write, but then come back, and when it's time to say, well, do I really want to call it Cedar Street? Do I really want to have uh, this, this, this kind of sounds like double talk to me. Can I say it more concisely? Then, then that's the time to be thinking about these kind of things. Now, talk about field stones. Who knows what field stones are? Okay. Anybody else? It's a, it's a New England concept or a northern concept. New England fields are very rocky, but you can make walls or buildings with the stones that when you clear them out of your, your field so that you can cultivate the field. What are you going to do with all those stones? You make piles of them somewhere for later use, or you go ahead and use them for, for um, fences and, or, or buildings. Well, it's the same with writing. You might think of a paragraph to write, or a description of something, or just a note about an idea that might fit into the story or poem you're, you're thinking about writing. So write that down. Don't, don't let it escape. Or, or maybe you're writing a story and you write something either right then or later, you feel like it doesn't really fit. Well, take it out and save it in a separate file called field stones. Now, New Englanders make piles of field stones, and I have a large file of field stones. Actually, I have one such file for each big project that I work on. And sometimes the field stones themselves can be the basis for a whole new project. You go back and read through your field stones once in a while. So that's a story idea. 
I didn't use it over here, but maybe I can develop it into something else over here. Here's one of my favorites. Murder your darlings. There, has anybody ever heard that one? Okay. Caroline's heard of that one. It's a, it's a very popular piece of writing advice. It's often attributed to William Faulkner, um, but apparently it can actually be traced back to the English writer Sir Arthur Quiller Couch. And he, this is what the, he quoted, if you here require a practical rule of me, I will present you with this. Whenever you feel an impulse to perpetrate a piece of exceptionally fine writing, obey it wholeheartedly and delete it before sending your manuscript to press. Murder your darlings. When he says an exceptionally fine, a piece of exceptionally fine writing, I think he's being sarcastic there. Because you may think it's brilliant, but it either doesn't fit or it's just not that brilliant. So it's, it's a metaphor for how you should behave towards your writing while you're, while you're revising it, again, while you're revising it. Um, the idea here is to proceed objectively and without sentiment. Don't leave something in that doesn't contribute to the story just because you like it. Grit your teeth and take it out. And I'll tell you what, it, it's not easy. Um, well, I won't go into any examples of that, but now what do you do with those darlings though? Don't delete them, put them in your Fieldstones file, right? Okay. I talked a little bit last week about first readers. Um, these are people you ask to read a draft of your work before you're completely finished with it. Probably not a first draft. You should give yourself some, some time to go through it a few times so it starts to really gel. But these people are like test pilots for you. It's like taking your work like a new ship you know, on a, on a shakedown cruise. Now these, are, these can be friends or family members. Um, probably would be kind of an imposition if it's a long piece to ask somebody you don't know very well to, to read it for you. So being friends and family members, they will be biased and they're gonna want to like your work. But you have to just ask them to be honest enough. You're not asking them to edit it. You're not asking them to change it. You're just asking them to tell you if they see any big problems. Do they understand it? Does it make any sense? Are there some glaring anachronisms? You know, things like that that just jump out when you're reading something that you may have missed because you're too close to it. I think this is a good idea for almost anything you write, whether it's a novel, short story, poem, or whatever. They can help, these people can help point out inconsistencies, redundancies, unanswered plot questions, and so on. And also, you don't, don't feel like you have to take all their advice. You know, only you fully understand what you're trying to do. And it may just be that they didn't get it because there was some tweaking that you could have done to make it easier for them to understand it. And you can still leave it in, still be good. And you will find your own style or, and your own voice in the process as you go through this. So talk about your work with other people as you write it, but don't talk, talk the life out of it. You don't have to take everybody's advice. Now let's talk about editing, some stuff to watch out for. What, I'm going to cover the first two here. First, uh, watch for too many adjectives. And then this is something we all fall victim to, too many adverbs. Adverbs like very, pretty, really, actually, fairly, just. You'll find that in the way we talk. But if you have a lot of that sort of stuff in, in your narrative, it's, it's going to get in the way. It comes off as lazy or forced. Uh, if you want, you can say, it was pretty good, but if you say, it was good, that really suffices most of the time. Now, there may be times when you want to put the adverb in there, but most of the time, you don't. Uh, the, man ran, uh, qu the man quickly ran away, or the man fled. You know, which is better? You don't need that, that adverb. The word fled has that action piece in it. Uh, it, it says quickly, just that, just that word. Now, um, I was amazed when I first heard about taking care to not have too many adverbs. Fortunately, you have a function on your computer if you're using Word, and probably other word processing programs have a similar thing. You have the find and replace, or just use the find. So punch find up there 
and then a dialog box will come up and you can type in the word really. And it'll show you where every place you use the word really in your, in your piece. And you can go through one at a time and decide if you want to take the word out each time or not. And you can do that with every one of these words. And I, uh, figuratively speaking, once I did that with all of these words in the, the first novel that I did it in, I had, figuratively speaking, a pile of adverbs on the floor as about as high as my knees. And it was really uh, a wake-up call. But the result was that the writing was much crisper. And it didn't change the meaning or the intention of what I was trying to say in, in, at all. Now, if you do too much of that stuff, too many adverbs, too many adjectives, it can result in something called purple prose. Have you ever heard that expression, purple prose? Sounds like it might mean risque, but it this doesn't mean that. It's characterized, as I said, by the excessive use of adjectives and adverbs and metaphors. Um, it's a text that's so extravagant, so ornate or flowery, that it breaks the flow and draws excessive attention to itself. And a lot of people, when they're starting to write, think they have to write like that in order to be considered a real writer. But let me give you an example of <coughs> purple prose. This is going to be a quote from what some people have called the worst novel of all time. I think it's a great example. I'll just read it. When on the eve of glory, whilst brooding over the prospects of a bright and happy future, whilst meditating upon the risky right of justice, there we remain, wanderers on the cloudy surface of mental woe, disappointment and danger, inhabitants of the grim sphere of anticipated imagery, partakers of the poisonous dregs of concocted injustice, yet such is life. What on earth did they say? <laughs> I have no clue what that's about. Now, that's from a, a novel called um, Irene Idlesley, I think I'm pronouncing it right, by a woman called Amanda McKittrick Ross uh, from the back in the 19th century. And I said, <laughs> that's considered the, perhaps the worst novel of all time. The author's husband, bless his heart, published Amanda's book as a 10th anniversary present. She, she wrote other books as well, apparently, and could never understand why nobody liked them. Even her name is flowery, Amanda McKittrick Ross, but we won't criticize her for that. All right, more stuff to watch out for. All right, I talked about the find and find and replace functions in words, and uh, so we can move on. Redundancy, no need for me to say that again. Passive voice versus active voice. This, is, uh, this amounts to overuse of the word was. It was a twisted tree versus the tree twisted into the sky. I think the second one is much better than the first one. The passive example here is some concern was felt by members of the team about the latest information. Frankly, that's boring. Who cares? But the active version of that would be Members of the team were concerned about the latest information. Oh, were they now? I wonder what the information was and why were they concerned? See, it grabs your interest. You can get hooked on it if you do it that way. Another one is varying sentence structure. Embrace short sentences. You don't have to write long sentences all the time. If your first sentence is a compound sentence with multiple clauses, then make the second sentence short and simple. Uh, here's an example. Frantic with hunger, Marlene opened the refrigerator for she knew there was leftover soup inside. Her stomach rumbled. You see how the, the, just, the juxtaposition of the longer sentence and the shorter sentence make for a very pithy uh, statement. At least, I must ad uh, admit, Amanda McKittrick Ross did that in the quote that we had before. She, her, la her second sentence was, yet such is life. So, Kudos for her. Sometimes even incomplete sentences are effective. Here's an example. He was right. I couldn't arrest him. No jurisdiction. Again, it depends on the style of writing, too. 
another thing you want to do is avoid too long and run-on sentences. A run-on sentence is uh, two or more independent clauses that are joined without an appropriate punctuation. The clauses run on into confusion instead of clarity. Um, here's an example. It is nearly half past five. We cannot reach town before dark. Well, you get the meaning, but it's not right. It just doesn't really work. Um, you know, it should be, it's nearly half past five, therefore we cannot reach town before dark, or so we can't reach town before dark, or something like that. You've got to connect it somehow um, with, uh, with, with a proper conjunction or, or another word. Also, um, a good tip when you do find a run-on sentence as you're going back and reading over your work. If, if you find a run-on sentence or one that's too long, make two sentences out of it. You know, if it had said, it is nearly half past five, period, we cannot reach town before dark, that would be fine. I would probably put a semicolon in there instead of a period, but again, it's, it's up to you. But either way, it, it su saves it from being a run-on sentence. Now, next is, uh, where am I here? Use a variety of transition words. Okay, what's a transition word? It could be a coordinating conjunction, and, but, for, a subordinating conjunction, although, because, or a conjunctive adverb, however, therefore, moreover. Okay, I just put you to sleep. These, these words are great as long as you vary them and don't fall back on pet phrases. And again, don't worry about whether you know what a conjunctive a subordinating conjunction is or a conjunctive adverb is. I don't know what they, what they are myself, and it's probably why I almost flunked English, actually. But I just threw them in there that, so you'd be impressed with my boundless scholarship. But who really cares? Just as long as you, you're writing something that sounds clear. Cut down on conjunctions by using semicolons. You don't always have to say and or but or or, or one of those. In a compound sentence, two independent clauses joined together, typically with a coordinating conjunction. But in your quest for varying sentence types, you can replace the conjunction with a semicolon after the first independent clause, and you've added variety to your sentence patterns. I can't believe I'm saying all this stuff because I know it, this sounds really boring, but it's important to, uh, to get this. Here's an example. The truck accelerated slowly because it carried a full load. Well, you don't need the because. The truck accelerated slowly, semicolon, it carried a full load. Carries the same message, but it's just a little crisper. And if you do that a little crisper all through your piece, your whole piece is going to be a lot crisper. Okay, good paragraphs often start with a pithy thesis statement, okay? So start your paragraphs off with a thesy, pithy thesis statement. A thesis statement is a type of sentence that's direct and declarative. Uh, longer sentence can, sentences can serve as theses, uh, but shorter really tends to be better. You follow up those with then with more descriptive sentences in the body of the paragraph. Here's another, here's an example. In last fall's class, uh, Sandy Gray wrote a piece that was only one paragraph long, but it had a great opening line. Here it is. Mother cried when the Italians surrendered. Wow. Immediately you're, you're drawn into that. You want to hear more, you know? Why did she cry? Why was it so important that the Italians surrendered? Well, then he used the rest of the paragraph to explain all that. And it was a perfect setup. And the rest of the paragraph was well done as well. Okay, the use of rhetorical questions. Um, there are statements phrased as questions used to stimulate the reader's mind. For example, what if there was no such thing as war? Well, it gets you thinking, doesn't it? Now, I don't use a lot of rhetorical uh, statements like that, or questions, uh, but once in a while it, it's a good, th good to throw something like that in there uh, to, th to uh, change things up and also just to get the, get the reader thinking. Let's talk about exposition. Don't spoon feed the reader. Uh, just let the information come out through the action rather than explaining it most of the time. For example, John and Sue got married. That's fine. S makes the statement. We get it. 
but people who attended John's and Sue's wedding will remember it for a long time is a lot more interesting. You kind of want to know, well, why will they remember it for a long time? As well as telling you that, yeah, they got married. Then vary word choices in a paragraph. You want to avoid repeating the same nouns or verbs in the same paragraph most of the time. Another example, living in prison often means joining a gang in order to stay safe. These violent groups, instead of saying gangs again, offer protection but also introduce dangerous risks. So as you're going back through your writing, look for the repeated words and find different words for them most of the time. Precision is the next point. The best word choices are specific. Like he wrote a poem on a piece of paper or he wrote a poem on a sheet of hotel stationery. It's a lot more specific, a lot more to the point you're trying to make. Um, the sun was out, not a cloud in the sky, and the temperature was perfect. That's much better than, it was a nice day. Another concept is called bookending. You wrap up the, uh, at the end of a story with something you started with. Uh, it really works best for articles, sometimes book chapters. Also think of it as a thread woven throughout. Uh, I don't remember whether Sandy did this or not, but talking about mother crying when the, because the, when the Italian surrendered, he could have ended that paragraph with some reference back to his mother being happy or the Italians being whatever they were, so that you have kind of a, a complete story from beginning to end just in that one paragraph. Now again, you don't have to do this in every paragraph, but it's something to keep in mind, especially I like to do it at the beginning of a chapter and then at the end of the chapter you wrap something up unless you're going to end the chapter with something that is a, is a kind of a uh, cliffhanger to get you into the next chapter. R uh, let's see, or cliches. Okay, cliches are okay for a dialogue and a character, but otherwise be careful using too many cliches. They're lazy, they're predictable, they call attention to themselves and they take away from the story. <coughs> now, if you're writing along, and you think of a cliche that goes here, go ahead and put it in just as a placeholder and then come back and say, well, that's a cliche, I need to change it. Do something else instead of that. But they're okay as placeholders. Uh, rising and falling action. You need to vary the intensity of the drama. You know, I've seen these TV shows where you have a 15 minute chase going on and frankly, after the first couple of minutes, it's boring, you know, give me a break. Uh, by the same token, a 15 minute picnic scene in the park can be pretty boring unless somebody falls into the pond. So, you know, change it up, give it some variety. And then less is more, write crisply. Uh, here's an example. I'm sending it in two formats in case one is easier for you to use. Well, if you take out the for you, it says the same thing, but it's a little crisper. I'm sending it in two formats in case one is easier to use. You know, the for you is understood. We all know that's what, what you're talking about. You don't have to put that in there. And then don't overuse the word that. Where is the book that I lent you? Don't need the word that in there. Where's the book I lent you? The that is understood. Now, You've looked back over all this stuff. In school, you had an assignment to write a thousand words about whatever. That was the assignment, write a thousand words about whatever. So what was your goal? Your goal was to write a thousand words. You didn't worry about whether you had too many adverbs. In fact, the more the better because I can get that thousand words in there. But that's not writing, you know? That's gaming the system. So don't do that. Let's talk a little bit more about conciseness and crisp writing. Here's some, uh, a couple of quotes by some people who know what they're talking about. Examine every word you put on paper. You'll find a surprising number that don't serve any purpose. Vigorous writing is concise. A sentence should contain no unnecessary words, a paragraph no unnecessary sentences, for the same reason that a drawing should have no unnecessary lines and a machine no unnecessary parts. Think of a car engine, you put an extra part in there, it's gonna blow up. 
Fortunately, your writing's probably not going to blow up, but it'll be a lot better if you make it crisp. Sometimes uh, I've found it's good to, uh, and, and fun, for me anyway, take a piece you've written and uh, say, all right, just uh, arbitrarily, I'm going to take 10% of the words out. So this maybe it's a 500-word short story or a 1,000-word short story. I'm going to take 100 words out of this and just go through and do it and do it and do it and do it until you get it down to 900 words and then ask yourself, is this worse than the 1,000-word version or is it better? Again, you get to make the decision and the choice, but if you've gone through that discipline, then you're practicing for something that you should be using every time you write. There's nothing, no magic to saying, I'm going to take 10% of the words out, but that's a good exercise. Um, I did that with the first draft of that short story, The Meeting at the Center of the Universe, and I'm convinced that's what helped got it, get it accepted. Uh, it, it really was a crisp boom, boom, boom story without any unnecessary words. And it took me a while because it was the first time I had done that exercise to get it down to whatever I was trying to get it down to. I think I was trying to get it down to below 200 words or something like that. Um, but I didn't want to overdo it, and you don't want to overdo it either. You're looking to cut out the fat, not the muscle and the bone. Okay. Now let's talk about the opening sentence. It's got to be a grabber. What's the point of the opening sentence? It's to draw the reader in. It's a hook. You need to give them something to make them want to read on. Uh, now, I didn't mention this earlier because uh, I didn't want you to be worried about it when you sit down to write. And you might not have a great opening sentence in your mind when you go sit down to write. So just write anyway, and you can always come back later and work on your opening sentence. You know, take away the one that you originally wrote if it's not the one you want. Um, and, 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 and write it. Here are some examples. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. What does he mean by that? <laughs> one of my favorites from The Metamorphosis by Franz Kafka. One morning when Gregor Samsa woke from troubled dreams, he found himself transformed in his bed into a horrible virgin, a vermin. What's the next one? Fred Tyler's hope sank when the dented Buick crested the hill dragging a muffler that threw a shower of sparks behind it like a fiery rooster tail. Why did his hopes sink? Why was the Buick dented? What was wrong with the muffler? What's going on in this thing? I gotta find out what's happening here. I walked into the meeting just in time to hear Jack Gamble say, if we can see into the past, why can't we see into the future? Interesting question, kind of rhetorical, leads you into the, into the story. And by the way, Jack Gamble was a name I picked on purpose because Jack's kind of a nice, crisp name. And Gamble, because this guy was the CEO of a company that made strange electronic stuff, and he was willing to take chances on things. So it fit his personality, even though I never made a point of it when uh, writing the story. The next one, today the old dogs of war would launch the death comm strategy they had been planning ever since Congress banned all the military's weapons. Really? Better find out what's going on there with Congress. And then, and here's a good one. Early one June morning in 1872, I murdered my father, an act which made a deep impression on me at the time. Now, you see why those are good opening sentences? And the last one, it was a dark and stormy night. Now, please avoid that one. <laughs> that was written by a guy named Sir, Sir Edward George Earl Bulwer Lytton, another, <laughs> another name that's purple prosy. And he wrote it in 1830. Uh, and, and it turns out he also did write purple prose like Amanda McKittrick Ross. Um, I've seen this line used as parody by James Patterson, who's a very successful mystery writer. Uh, you've probably seen Snoopy, uh, the Charles Schultz character, talking about uh, using that quote in, in some of the cartoons, using it as a joke. And, and truly, it was a good opening line the first time, <laughs> but it's a cliche now, so avoid that one. Let's talk about titles. 
Similarly to the uh, opening sentence, the title should be a grabber. And also, it, ideally, it's going to be a hint at what the book or the story or the poem is about. But maybe just a little bit mysterious so the reader will be intrigued. Just look at some of these. Can you, can you see some of these? Bulletproof. Bear trap, spelled B-A-R-E. The case of the half-awakened wife. The fourth postman down here, three quarters of the way down. I mean, every one of those uh, is, a, is kind of a grabber. Now sometimes you don't want to title your, your piece until um, you're finished writing it and then you have a better idea what the piece is really about and you can come up with a title. Sometimes you'll have a title in your head and you write a piece about, about that because the title is so good. Again, it just depends. But the point is understanding what the importance of the title is and what its function is. Um, there's a great resource, again, online. If you just go Google famous book titles, you'll get lists of great titles and they might inspire you. Uh, I wouldn't say copy any of them, but... Um, but it'll, again, give you more examples to think about and probably a wider range of the kind of titles that you can consider using. Um, and uh, maybe you're not writing a book, but really it's the same for stories and poems. So let me give you an example of a piece that's called, it's called Flash Fiction, which is really, as I said, a very short, short story. This one will be without a title. The older couple waited while the funeral director added up the estimated costs for their eventual Burial, caskets, memorial service, hearse, cemetery plot, grave marker, flowers, etc. She gave them the sheet and they looked at it a long time. Then came the question she wasn't expecting. Do we get a senior discount? <laughs> what kind of a title would you give that one? AARP. AARP, <laughs> all right. Anybody else want to throw something out? <laughs> All right, take you out of your misery. Here's the title. Actually, I did write that, and it's a true story. <laughs> we were here at River Landing. They want you to fill out that purple, that, that orange form, and they want you to put down what your burial instructions are and all that stuff. So Carol and I said, well, you know, we're not there yet, but maybe we should go ahead and do it. So we invited a woman who represents one of the funeral homes around here to come to our house and talk to us and she took us through all the stuff and she added it all up and handed it to us and that was the first thing that came to my mind do we get the senior discount <laughs> she, she didn't know what to do <laughs> anyhow um, and that's not a memoir I think it's really kind of a joke the other point is um, I thought maybe I could enter it in the Press 53, 53 word story competition. I may have mentioned before, Press 53 is a publisher in Winston-Salem. They focus mostly publish poems, but they have a, a free uh, contest every month to enter a 53 word short story. Now they'll give you a theme, and so far they haven't been given me a theme that this works in, but it's only 53 words, so I'm ready if they, if they hit me with a theme that I wanna send this up in, to, in for. And, and, and so, again, it goes back to that discipline. I had to get this down to 53 words. It probably started out as 75 or something. And so, hack, 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 and get it down to where it's just, there's not one word in there. You might find a word that's not necessary, but I was happy with the 53. And uh, I mentioned that it's kind of a memoir. I've never written a memoir, so I don't have a lot to say about them. But if you, if you are writing a memoir, Google memoirs, and you'll come up with tremendous, uh, good, tremendously good resources online to help you write memoirs, or just about anything else, short stories, whatever. Uh, you can look up, um, you can look that kind of stuff up. And the ever popular question for writers, writers and artists and creative people of all kinds, is it done yet? How do you know when you're finished with a piece? Everybody has this problem, whether you're a painter or a sculptor, poet, musician, writers. For me, it's keep tweaking it until it seems I'm making it worse, not better. That works for me. Or 
I'm just sick and tired of tweaking, and then, 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 then I should just let it sit for a while and then come back to it because I'll be looking at it with fresher eyes. Sometimes, after I've tweaked and tweaked and set it aside, I'll notice, hey, I haven't thought about that piece for a while, which means I have a sort of a piece about it. And in that case, it's probably done. I don't have any, any tension about it. Now, here's another one. You got it written. It's done. Formatting. You're going to send it to somebody, presumably. And this, this is for just about any publisher, including, I would say, if you're going to send something to for Encompass or River Currents. You should have a good, uh, a good format that shows that your work is, is, is professional, really. It's, this is your packaging. You're, it's just like anything else you buy. You look at how it's presented. And the proper formatting gives, you, uh, gives it a professional polished look. It tells an editor that you're not a beginner. Then you take some pride in your work, um, that you're serious about it and you know what you're doing. So an editor, seeing something formatted properly like this, is going to be more favorably disposed to considering your work uh, than if it just looked haphazardly put together, even if it's brilliant. Um, now, since the sample page here is not on your handout, uh, you might want to take a picture of the screen. I invite you to do so if you want to while I kind of go through the what is, what's on here. I don't know if you can see this little red dot, which is what I'll put here just before I shoot the thing. Okay, name and contact info up here on the upper left. The word count over here, kind of out of the way. I guess the meeting at the center of the universe, uh, I was looking for 500 words, so I got it down to 498. The margins are approximately one inch on either side. And it's aligned left, it's not justified. Justified means that, it, that you would have a straight line down here with, with the, the way the type works. You don't have to do that when you're formatting it for submission. Once they do the typesetting and put it into a book form or a magazine, it will be justified. The title and the byline, obviously, go up at the top. Use a, a, a standard 12-point type, typeface or font, like, uh, like uh, Times New Roman or Garamond or something like that. Those are the, seem to be the two that publishers like, and they're easy to work in. Make it double-spaced. Now, for poetry, you can space it any way you want, because sometimes for a poem, the spacing and the way the, and the, way the lines are laid out is, becomes part of the poem, uh, the, way, the way it looks. So, so double spacing is just, for, um, is just for prose. Indent your paragraphs. You don't have an extra space between paragraphs. In this case, you just indent the paragraphs. Um, in the upper right, and you don't see it on this because this is page one, but starting with page two, put your last name and the page number in the upper right corner. And then optionally, you can put the, uh, the file name and the copyright information down at the bottom. Copyright Walt Pilcher down here at the bottom. Now, sometimes if you're submitting to a contest, for example, they'll say, submit it without any identifying information on, on there. Put your contact information in the cover letter or the email that you're sending it with. So you just omit the, uh, you know, omit the, um, where is it, uh, the file name and all that stuff, and omit your, uh, omit your contact information and omit the uh, surname and uh, on the next page, the, the following pages. Don't omit the page numbers though. Page numbers are important. Okay, does that make sense? Nobody wants to take a picture of the screen. All right, then I'll move on. Uh, I will say that um, while this is fairly standard formatting, different publishers do have slightly different requirements sometimes. So if you're going to submit something to a publisher, make sure you read their guidelines and follow them to the letter. I mean, some of them are so s sticky about it that if you don't follow it to the letter, they won't even read your stuff. So um, be careful. But this, this is a, be a good place to start. And when you're doing the exercises that you're going to submit, um, 
Try putting them in a format like this. Now, where to submit your work? Sorry? It's find a new Roman twelve point standard. Yes. Yeah. Okay, I'll run through these quickly. Uh, where to submit your work. And here we're talking about articles, short stories, and poems. Um, traditional outlets, magazines, alumni magazines, online and printed journals, there's tons of them. Uh, agents, if you're talking about a novel, you, you have to go through agents. And I talked about that last week but you have to have a pretty good query letter to get an agent uh, interested in it. The outlets at River Landing, River Currents and, and Compass. And then just go on Facebook, YouTube, Medium Daily Digest, Blogging Press, 53, month, uh, 53 word short story contests, as, as I mentioned. And um, you can find places to, uh, to submit this stuff. And finally, Here's a list of resources, and this is on your handout. Uh, and these are all pretty good. Uh, you can, and they're all easily uh, available. The, uh, the one I was going to mention was um, in connection with where to submit your work. If you drop down, it says North Carolina Writers Network. This is a really good source of information on submission opportunities, contests, and classes, and so forth. You'll get if you sign up. I think they're. To join, it's maybe $30 a year or something like that. It's very nominal. Uh, but you'll get a weekly email that has tons of information about where to submit things and what contests are going on, as well as, uh, as, well as the resources of the network itself uh, in terms of um, you know, finding tips on writing and, and, uh, and so forth, how to do this and how to do that. And there's something called masterclass.com on, online. It's an online resource for all kinds of things, not just writing. And um, like I've said several times already, there's just, there's just plenty of online resources. <laughs> there's an even a new website I discovered when I was looking for opening lines. It's called greatopeninglines.com. I mean, a website devoted just to that. So you can find all that stuff. That is it for today. And if there's time, there is one minute, two minutes actually, if you have any questions. Nobody has any questions. All right. Well, then, good. Again, thank you for coming, and I hope this was helpful. Um, for the submissions, again, just put them in my box or email them to me, and uh, get them. please get them to me by Friday. So I'll have the weekend. I know it's the Easter weekend, so I really do need to have them uh, by Friday, and no later. And uh, so I'll have time to go through them. Um, See if there was anything else I wanted to talk about. Oh, well, again, I said this before. So next week, uh, what I'm going to do, based on whatever I get in terms of submissions, is ask some of you to st come up here and, and read, your, read your stuff. And then we'll have some discussion. Not really a critique, but just kind of discussion of what the good points were and uh, you know, what have we learned from, from this particular exercise. So again, thanks for coming. Thanks to Brian. Thanks to Ferl. Thanks to my lovely wife who hands out the handouts and <laughs> helps me bring all this stuff down here. And uh, we'll see you next week.